28. Uh, we're going to read the whole psalm. And as you're arriving there, let me pray to God for his help as we come to his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've been thinking all morning about how you hear your people's prayers. You hear our prayers. Please help us to, to never lose the wonder of such a privilege. As we come to your word this morning, we draw near to you with the full assurance of faith and ask that you would help us to understand your word and to be transformed by it. We pray these things for your glory, for our growth, and the good of those around us. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's read Psalm 28, beginning at verse 1. To you, O Lord, I call my rock. Be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands towards your most holy sanctuary. Do not drag me off with the wicked, with the workers of evil who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Give to them according to their work and according to the evil of their deeds. Give to them according to the work of their hands. Render them their due reward. Because they do not regard the works of the Lord or the works of his hands, he will tear them down and build them up no more. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. O oh, save your people, and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd, and carry them forever. Amen. As Samuel said, over the summer months, we're looking at a collection of, of 10 psalms, Psalms 25 through 34, and in this section of the psalms, the, the big theme is confrontation. That's certainly one of the, the big themes. God's king is embattled on every side. Uh, someone helpfully summarized uh, one of the main themes of this block of Psalms by quoting the Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 1, uh, Luke chapter 12 even, and where he says, I will show you whom you should fear. In other words, when faced with distressing and fearful situations, the good and right response is the fear of the Lord, a right appreciation of who he is. Specifically, David trusts in his great and awesome Lord in the face of hostility and adversity. And so David is teaching us this summer how to rightly respond to adversity as we get a, a glimpse into David's own heartfelt struggles it's as though the psalmist encourages our gaze upwards. He shows us and reminds us of what God is like and therefore how we can trust him despite our very own deeply felt circumstances. Crucially, every week we have been launched forwards to the Lord Jesus and how the psalm is fulfilled in him, our king and our savior. In Psalm 28 that we just read, the exact nature of David's plight is unknown to us. We're not 100% sure of David's exact life situation, but perhaps he's perplexed by not knowing who his true friends are. Verse 3 says, do not drag me off with the wicked, 
with the workers of evil who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Another translation of the Bible, the NIV, puts it like this. They speak cordially with their words to their neighbors, but harbor malice in their hearts. Perhaps he's just discovered that he's at the receiving end of deceitfulness. It wouldn't be helpful to be overly speculative, but but we can ask a, a number of questions as we come to the text. How does David deal with this bewildering sense of, of, of helplessness and confusion? How, how do we deal with similar realities? After all, David is not alone in such struggles. He faces them in ways unique to him and his time and culture, but the, the words of this psalm are the words of a, a heart struggle that transcends any time and place. How, how does David point us to Jesus in such a way that we can take the greatest confidence in Christ even when we face uh, trials of various kinds? Uh, let's answer these questions with the help uh, of Psalm 28. How we're going to tackle the psalm is by paying attention to it, its structure, excuse me. Structurally, there's a, a couple of helpful observations we can make uh, about this psalm. First, you maybe have noticed uh, David began the psalm desperate, urgently calling out to God in prayer, even speaking of the fear of death in verse 1. But by the end of the psalm, David bursts into song. Verse 6, blessed be the Lord. Verse 7, my heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. What is it that causes David to go from doom and gloom to joy and song? A second really helpful observation, and this will guide us this morning, that the psalm has this wonderfully unique structure that draws our attention to the middle section. Hebrew poetry is often so carefully and beautifully crafted with layers of meaning. One thing you can notice with me uh, about how the, the psalm is structured, you'll notice verse 1, there's a prayer, and then there's a, 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 at the end, verses 7 to 9, there's praise. Those are the, the bookends. And then as you go into the psalm, in verse 2, you hear, hear the voice of my pleas for mercy. And in verse 6, he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. And then in the center, you've got verses 3 and 5, which describe the, the wicked and, and some of David's situation. That middle section seems to be the center of gravity, uh, and it's where we'll begin. I think the, the psalm teaches us two important lessons about dealing with adversity. Uh, first, that we must abandon the, the lie of self-sufficiency or self-reliance. Uh, and second, we must depend entirely on our faithful and saving Lord. So those are our two points this morning. Firstly, uh, avoid or abandon the lie of self-sufficiency. So we um, read verses 3 to, to 5 again. I think that would be really helpful. From verse 3, do not drag me off with the wicked, with the workers of evil, who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Give to them according to their work, and according to the evil of their deeds, give to them according to the work of their hands, render them their due reward. Because they do not regard the works of the Lord or the works of his hands, he will tear them down and build them up no more. David's prayer in this little section is a, a, a two-parter. He first prays that he himself won't be likened to or judged with the wicked. And then he asks God, give the wicked what they deserve in verse 4. Uh, that first petition is fascinating, I think. Do not drag me off with the wicked. Drag off suggests the idea of criminals being dragged off to execution. Well, what's unique about this psalm is that David doesn't seem to be asking God for 
protection from the wicked as he does in lots of the other Psalms. What David is asking for is not, Lord, protect me from these wicked people who want to do me harm, but, but instead, Lord, do not include me among these wicked people when you come to do them harm. It's interesting because while David clearly doesn't think of himself as one of the, uh, those who do evil uh, and asks God to repay them for their evil deeds, he also clearly thinks that there's some chance that when God does that, he'll include David as one of the evil people and that David is in need of mercy on that account. I think David fears the, the power and influence of the wicked. The first line of verse 3 seems to suggest that they are able to involve others in their ruin. But what is it that the, the wicked do? Well, we're told they speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. So they lie a little bit. What's so evil about that? Uh, Spurgeon really helpfully put it this way. I'm commenting on these verses. Soft words, oily with pretended love, are the deceitful material of the infernal net in which Satan catches the precious life. Uh, this week, our summer life groups, which uh, Samuel invited us all to come along to on a Wednesday, uh, we were looking at, at John chapter 8. This is what the Lord Jesus says. He's speaking uh, to uh, the Jewish crowds, and he says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus says that lying is the devil's mother tongue, and if it's a pattern of life, repeated and unrepented in our lives, it shows who you truly belong to. It's quite serious. And David has liars and two-faced hypocrites in mind as he writes, but, but David tells us more. He tells us their motivation. Ultimately, they care only about themselves, and that's where this all stems from. Did you notice that in, in verse 5? Because they do not regard the works of the Lord or the works of his hands, he will tear them down and build them up no more. In fact, in, in verse 4, the psalmist mentions the work of their own hands twice, as though to suggest that they prize self-sufficiency and their own efforts higher than the idea of God. They're functional atheists, even if they do claim to believe in and serve God. At the heart of their problem is that they've believed the lie that they don't need God. Hence, they only care about themselves. Hence, they're all too comfortable lying to people. I hope you'll appreciate the, the, the logical leap when I ask us if we're ever tempted to believe such a lie, the I don't need God, I just need myself. I was at a camp um, for Christian teenagers two weeks ago. I'm still knackered um, from it. Uh, it was fascinating to hear them reflecting uh, about the world that they live in, reflecting on the, the fact, as they put it, that everything around them seems to be convincing them and compelling them to live their lives for themselves. Everything around them, good as they are in and of themselves, promise them that, that nothing can stop them. You can buy whatever you want, get whatever you want, be whoever you want, and it's your job to make it happen, no matter even the relational cost. 
I find those conversations really helpful and stimulating. I, I think this lie can creep into our thinking spiritually. Uh, I've thought this myself, and I, I notice it in younger Christians having worked uh, with them for the last five or six years. Uh, it looks like this, usually. When I get older, when I mature as a Christian, uh, I'll finally stop struggling. Uh, I'll never have to ask people to pray for me. Uh, I finally get to not confess my sins because I'll be older and mature uh, and self-sufficient. Uh, you don't have to be 17 to, to spend some time reflecting uh, in what areas uh, of my life am I tempted to believe that I don't need God. Whether it's in my finances, in my own fight against sin, in my marriage, in parenting, in my retirement. I'm aware that the question is broad, but it's a, a worthwhile exercise. I, I did the exercise myself, and it's really exposing and revealing. Uh, I could identify things in my own life that if I boiled them down, it came down to me deciding what's best for me, even though God has set things in place. People in my life, people with authority over me to guide and instruct me. I don't need God in this one. I think I know best in, in this area of life. Uh, David is about to show us that the, the godly response to, to challenges isn't self-reliance, but Christ-dependence. David finds life and joy in total, unashamed, radical dependence on the Lord, and it changes him. But whether we can see the lie of self-sufficiency infiltrating our thinking and our actions or not, I think we ought to heed Psalm 28, verses 3 to 5, uh, as a sober warning uh, against allowing that message into our hearts and lives. Uh, there's a reason that David says, do not drag me off with the wicked. Uh, I was thinking about it corporately as well. Are, are my friends or, or the people I hang about with, maybe your colleagues, all too happy to lie if it will serve them best? How much am I absorbing the world view behind that uh, and letting it poison me at the risk of being dragged off with the wicked? Uh, the warning is made all the more clear as David asks that God in verse 4 give to them according to their work and according to their evil deeds. The emphatic point uh, of verse 4 is that the punishment will perfectly fit the crime. There's nothing to suggest that David's agenda is vindictive. Uh, his concern for <clears throat> retribution doesn't come from some morbid sense of joy and suffering. Rather, the, the king pleads for God's covenant to be upheld. He simply asks that God do what he has promised to do. Uh, the wicked have had their chance, but instead of accepting the, their responsibility to the Lord, they have showed their disregard for him. They, they haven't learned how to respond to God and his mighty acts in the history of redemption. They don't show a, a proper regard for the works of his hands, as the psalmist puts it, his work of creation his work of sovereign grace and love, salvation, which should lead us to, to trust in him. Instead, they have occupied themselves with the works of their own hands, and their due punishment is their destruction. That Their fate is terrifying. The end of verse 5, he will tear them down, that is the Lord, and build them up no more. No wonder David asks God that he isn't dragged off with the wicked and why he begins the psalm as he does, uh, which leads to our, our second point and much, much cheerier. 
that we embrace the freedom of total dependence on the Lord. Uh, two ways that, that, that David depends on God and one way he rejoices in the God he depends on. Uh, firstly, they depend on the Lord's covenant faithfulness. Did you, did you notice as we read it a couple of times the, the urgency of verses 1 and 2? The psalmist calls, pleads, cries, and lifts up hands in prayer. David goes as far as saying, Lord, if you don't listen to me, I have absolutely no hope. Now imagine just for a moment a world in which God doesn't hear our prayers, but he's deaf to them. What a terrifying prospect. No wonder the idea of the silence of God affects David so much he imagines death in the pit. Uh, the psalmist's opening remarks remind me uh, of an old hymn, I Need Thee Every Hour. The, the, fir- the third verse of that hymn captures some of David's heart. I need thee every hour in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide or life is vain. What do you hear when you read verses 1 and 2 as you see them on the page in front of you. I know for myself, I instinctively think of the Psalms as as expressions of dependence. I'm sometimes tempted to only see the the vulnerable and uh, emotional musician in, in the Psalms, to only see the harpist who says, I need you, I need you, please listen, don't stop listening. I'm tempted to think of David as very needy. When I do that, uh, I forget and ignore the king who smashes my pride to pieces, who has no time for this idea of self-sufficiency and models the fear of the Lord and dependence on him. It struck me greatly this this week to think about the king, the most powerful man in the country, the slayer of Goliath, no less, expressing his complete and total dependence on God, his rock. David looks upward and not inward. Uh, The illustration that comes to mind that has helped me and my own heart and to correct my self-dependence is a very simple one. Uh, Just on Friday for the Olympic opening ceremony, we had Kieran and Sarah Kelleher and the kids round for pizza. It was great fun. They are very well known to many in our congregation, previously a minister in training here with us. Uh, Tig, their oldest boy, is great fun. And uh, he will ask almost anyone that he knows well to carry him. Uh, it was really lovely, actually, seeing Hillary, my wife, carry Tig, and it was really lovely seeing Tig asking Kieran to pick him up and carry him. Uh, a child feels no guilt asking their father to carry them. It's not clingy or, or needy or high maintenance. It's utter dependence. And just as Tyke's dependence is grounded on his dad's love and his friendship with Hillary, so the psalmist grounds his dependence, and he grounds it in the character and track record of the Lord. Verse 1 refers to God as Lord, all caps, Yahweh, the covenant Lord. In the ears of Old Testament saints, this form of address was the equivalent to to you, my father. The Lord had invited his people to call on him in distress. David calls the Lord his rock, a term he's used in the Psalms already and will continue to use, the one who gives strength and sustenance to his people and provides refuge for his own. In verse 2, the prayer is addressed towards your most holy sanctuary where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, the part of the temple most closely associated with the presence of God. In other words, 
David prays on the basis of the covenant that God has made with him. That the psalmist prays to the all-merciful God that he may come to his help. David cannot deliver himself, but he trusts that the Lord will extend divine mercy to him. And it's precisely because David knows and appeals to God's covenant faithfulness that what comes in verses 6 and 7 isn't actually a surprise. David also teaches us to depend on the Lord who who answers our prayers. Let me read verses um, 6 and 7 again. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts and with my song I give thanks to him. So what a turnaround. Blessed be the Lord. That that acknowledges that all blessings come from the covenant Lord, and in particular the blessing that the, the king's pleas for mercy have been heard. We have no given reason in the psalm to think that David's prayer has already been answered as such, but David's confidence looks like anticipation of the Lord doing what David has requested. Uh, David can be confident that Yahweh will answer his prayer because David has prayed in accordance with Yahweh's own word and character. His praise is the outflow of his faith. He is sure that the covenant Lord will keep his promises. And David says of God in verse 7, The Lord is my strength and my shield. I am helped. As the Lord employs his power on the psalmist's behalf, and infuses strength into his hour of weakness so much so that he can say those words. No no longer does he feel threatened to the point of despair as he did in the opening of the psalm. Rather, he is overjoyed and in a singing mood. It's amazing what freedom dependence can bring us. Dependence on the Lord, grounded on his character, can set us free to to remember who he is, even when the backdrop of our lives is adverse circumstances. David doesn't waste his energy engaging his enemies on this occasion, or defending himself, or pursuing another humanly crafted strategy. He receives horizontal affliction and opts for a vertical solution. Uh, David himself was a soldier, so he really understood shields and their military use. It's as if the picture being painted is that of the, the Christian soldier sheltered behind our God and infinitely more protected than if we had the latest in defensive military technology. It will be a a, a daily battle to do as David does here. Funnily enough, with the the military language, it will be a battle. What we'll have to drill daily and preach to ourselves, whatever it is we're going through, I am helped. As New Testament Christians, we have so many more reasons to praise God for the help that we have received. I was teaching one Peter uh, at the camp we were doing uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I just can't help but be drawn to what he says in chapter 1. Similarly, like the psalmist, he bursts into praise in light of what he knows about the God whom he serves. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth and a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
to an inheritance that is imperishable, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation that is waiting to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, says Peter, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When I remember who God is and that I am helped, that he hears and answers my prayers, uh, the result is spelt out for us by the psalmist. My heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. I love an old commentator as a musician myself who put it this way. A song is the soul's fittest method of giving vent to its happiness. Maybe that will be our testimony as we close with some singing later on. When confronted with trials of various kinds, as David has been through this block of Psalms and as he finds himself today in Psalm 28. Well, what about us when facing similar situations? Do we do like David and reach for our shield? Or do we reach for something else? I've been asking myself a lot um, over this past week, well, what's my shield of choice? When, when harmed, when, when sinning, when anxious, when sad, what's my shelter of choice? What, do, what does my heart express its dependence on? What lesser things do I, do we turn to rather than God in those moments? If we're completely honest with ourselves, we don't always respond to our circumstances by remembering God's character and his previous and his promised faithfulness. Our instinct might not be to think of Christ on the cross and the hope of heaven. And that is why the, the final verses of this psalm are, are such good news. David encourages us to rejoice in the Lord's salvation. Uh, did you notice how the language of the psalm becomes um, plural? In verses 8 and 9, it goes from this very individual plea to a corporate one. Uh, the psalmist's confidence in God goes beyond his own experience. He knows that the Lord is the God of his people. And David here foreshadows our Lord Jesus, our covenant head, our anointed prince, through whom all blessings come to us. In the same way that David intercedes on behalf of the people of Israel, the, the Lord Jesus may be seen here pleading as the representative of his people. And we can rejoice because the God who saved Christ will save all of Christ's people. Uh, David uses the words strength and refuge in verse 8. Because God is the refuge of the Messiah, he is the strength of the Messiah's people. The, the Father saved his Son so that the Son could save his people. Finally, let me, let me read verse 9 again. O oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. In David's descendant, we, we see why we also can trust in the Lord and with even greater certainty and confidence than David. Uh, while David cried for God to, to be their shepherd and carry them forever. The Lord Jesus Christ came as the good shepherd, and he carries his sheep in his arms. 
before we, we close, I've just got two thoughts for, for, for all of us. I find the, the, the Psalms as beautiful as I find them hard to, to get my head around, particularly their emotive nature. I'd love to, to chat about this psalm with you after the, the service. But, but to anyone here or, or watching at, at home who, who with integrity would say that you don't think that you need God, can I invite you to take the words uh, of Scripture really seriously? Uh, in, in verse 3, the wicked are dragged off to be torn down in judgment. In contrast, in verse 9, the Lord carries his people forever. Uh, on the one hand, those who disregard the works of the Lord, who ignore, whether willfully or otherwise, his gift of creation and life and all his blessings in this life, crucially, his salvation plan accomplished in the person of Jesus by his work on the cross and in his resurrection, they will be given their just reward. Uh, the Bible is really clear that to say no to Jesus uh, and to only live for self is rebellion, or as the psalmist puts it, evil. I'd invite you to consider what it would mean to express your dependence on Jesus for your salvation. Talk to anyone here. We're all willing to share what that looks like for us. But dear brother and sister, as we sing this psalm with Jesus, our anointed king, we do hear and, and heed the warning to abandon or avoid self-dependence, which in turn leads us to pushing God out and living for self and lying to achieve our goals. But, but above all, we rejoice that our prayers are heard in the anointed king's name. In him, we are in unbreakable covenant with the living God. Maybe those are thoughts for us to keep in mind as in a brief moment we sing the very words of Psalm 28 together. But before that, and as the band come up, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus where David failed to depend on you in many ways, he depends in the Lord perfectly. And therefore, we too can be blessed by the Lord, even though we fail to depend on him as we should. Forgive us when we are tempted to allow the idea that we don't need you into our lives. We rejoice, Lord, that if we're trusting in you, you are our shield. We are your special possession. And you will shepherd and carry us forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have two closing items of praise. We're going to sing the words of Psalm 28.